Let me tell you something. You need to build up your stamina for this next season. <laughs> we get tired too easy, and sometimes it's a metaphor of how we're living life. There's a time to rest, and there's a time to get up and go take the land. There's a time to pursue. There's a time to rest, and there's a time to pursue. There's a time to fight, and that time is approaching. Second Kings chapter 6. Verse 15, scripture says, now when the attendant, the servant of the man of God, had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha answered, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Tell somebody I ain't ever scared. When God is with me. <laughs> you know, when you walk in certain communities and certain neighborhoods, based on who you with, you either have confidence or you get a little nervous. And God is saying, if I'm with you, you've got nothing to worry about. Do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed. Oh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes that he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I want to take for emphasis verse 17. Then Elisha prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes that he may see. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I want to preach from the topic. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see that? You may be seated. Father, we want to see what you're showing. Open our eyes, dear God. If there's a veil because of the issues and problems of life, remove it today so we can see that there are more with us than are against us. Father, use me as a vessel. Use me as a a voice, dear God, as a pastoral voice and a prophetic voice. As you lead this church to whatever is next, we celebrate you and your work In the midst of this, let there be an anointing with this word, an anointing with this moment that that meets our needs both personally and corporately because we need a word from the Lord. Use me now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's commonly believed that the human body has five core senses. Smell, touch, taste, hearing, and sight. That's what they told you when you were growing up in grade school. Five primary senses that a sense is a biological process for gathering information about our surroundings through stimuli. That we use our nose to smell. Anybody know the power of scent? Which is why you anticipate Thanksgiving over every other meal in your life. Because Thanksgiving has a smell. Y'all know what Thanksgiving smells like. I got beans, greens, tomatoes potatoes, lambs. You, you, you have embedded in your psyche this, this scent and it reminds you and it triggers memories. Our, our, our nose is used to smell. Our skin is used to touch. We taste things with our tongue. We hear things through our ears and we see things through our eyes. Our senses help our brain to experience and interpret the world around us. We use our senses to navigate the world, right? You know, you put your feet on the ground. If God has blessed you with the ability to walk, your feet touch the ground and you, and you walk and, and you're driving your car and you use your eyes to see, but then you use your ears to hear when someone's honking their horn. All these things, they bring warning. They bring information. They bring excitement. They bring enjoyment, right? We listen to music and we feel a certain type of way. We hear the voice of a loved one and it does something to our heart. All these senses work together, help to help us experience and interpret the world around us. Now, the average human being experiences these senses individually, but there are a few people who experience what we call a merging of the senses. For example, some musicians don't just hear music, they actually see music, which is why they're so creative. While we just hear with our ears, as they hear with their ears, they're literally seeing in their mind the notes and the the songs, and the melodies, and the harmonies. This is what we call synesthesia. Say that, synesthesia. 
Say that three times fast. Synesthesia. Achoo. Synesthesia. Synesthesia is the blending of the senses. The root word sin, S-Y-N, means together, jointly, unity, right? And then anesthesia means sensasia, sensation. Like when you go under anesthesia, no sensation. They put you under so you don't feel anything. Sensation. Sin, like synthesizer, synergy, joined together. And so synesthesia is the blending of senses together. For example, a well-known artist like Pharrell has synesthesia. He sees music in color. Every note has a color that corresponds with it and allows him to visualize music in his mind. I don't know about you, that's kind of cool. Isn't it kind of unbelievable? that the human mind is capable of doing those things, that even some folks that we have thought to be neurodivergent actually have what we would see as almost like superpowers, They're able to see things, do things that are amazing because of the way that God wired their brain. Can we just take a moment to appreciate how wonderful this human body is? And can we appreciate God for his creativity in creating us, that we serve a God who designs people. Did you know that you were designed? There was a concept of you before there was conception of you. That God had a concept in his mind before your mama met your daddy and before they came together and before there was life in your mother's womb. Watch this. There was a concept in God's mind. Psalm 139 and 13 says, For you formed me Inward, my inward parts, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. That, 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 that life begins before life. If God has a concept of a person that before that person enters into their mother's, their mother's womb, that God designs and, and weaves, and there's something beautiful and miraculous and sacred that happens within a woman's womb. Verse 14 says, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And we celebrate the works of God because we are his workmanship. We celebrate the works of God, not just what he's done around us, not just what he's done for us, but what he's done to us and through us, that you are the workmanship of God, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's so important that we as the body of Christ understand our identity in this season. You need to know who you are in times like this. And I'm here to let you know that the scripture says that there was a holy God who loved you so much that he formed you before you were in your mother's womb, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in a world that's wrestling with identity. People are having issues understanding who they are, and so people are making stuff up. People are allowing anybody with a YouTube page or an Instagram account to speak into their life concerning identity, and here we are in a worship service with the Word of God opened up, and I'm telling you that God knows you and formed you, that you have an identity and part of coming to worship services and listening to preaching and getting in the scriptures is so that you can understand who God really created you to be. Somebody say, I'm wonderfully made. I'm fearfully made. If you're wrestling with the way you look in the mirror, remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you're struggling even with your creativity and the way that you think, understand that God knew how you were made before you were made. And somehow he wants to get the glory out of your frame, out of your life, out of your thinking, out of your abilities. If you're looking at somebody else and you're coveting the way God made them, why don't you take time to explore how God made you? He made us all different with different talents. You may not have synesthesia, but you've got an anointing for something. You were created for something. And part of getting to know God is getting to to know why he created you the way that he created you the writer says my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when I was yet there when yet there was not one of them in other words God has in a book all the days ordained for us, even the days that we have not arrived at, God sees and God knows, which means that whatever happened before you walked in this sanctuary today, God knew. Whatever happened this week to rock your world, God knew. 
Whatever has happened in your life, whatever is going to happen in your life, God knows he sees you. And on top of that, that doesn't negate the fact that he skillfully and wonderfully made you. And maybe he made you for just a time as this. Maybe he built you in such a way that you can survive what you've been through so that you can give him glory for the fact that he knows you. You want to have a story? Then let him get the glory. And sometimes through the ups and downs of life, he's shaping us into the more perfect thing that we are called to be. His eyes have seen our unformed substance. He designs us and creates us and fashions us. We serve a God who can make something out of nothing. In theology, it's what we call ex nihilo. That's Latin for out of nothing, out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and the earth was void. And we see God creating something out of nothing. Before you in your mother's womb, God created from unformed substance. He created you out of nothing. He is the creator God. He takes nothing and makes something out of it. And that ought to encourage you, because if he did it before, he can do it again. He has not lost his ability to take desperate voids and create something out of them. He has not lost his ability to create something out of nothing. He's still creating uh, ways in the wilderness. He's still creating rivers in the desert. He still has the creative power for whatever situation we find ourselves in. And you need to know that he's still able to perform miracle. You are a miracle. And he performed his work through you, and he's still performing miracles to this day. We serve a God who can make something out of nothing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I can do something with those eight hand claps. 25 years ago, God created something out of nothing. New Vision International Ministries. Something out of nothing. Just reflect on this. 25 years ago, a week from today, there was no new vision. Just think about that for a second. There was no New Vision International Ministries. God spoke to Bishop Calhoun, and, and, and God began to deal with Bishop about a new church. And for 30 days, he fasted and prayed and sought the face of the Lord. And then, based on the leading of the Lord, with 14 people in his basement, he and Pastor Sharon, God made something out of nothing. That with 14 people in the basement of his house, here we are 25 years later, and look at this. I mean, just like, just take a moment. I mean, you're sitting in cushioned chairs. You've got a big LED wall. You've got lighting. But most importantly, you've got people that love God, love people, and do the work of the kingdom. You're in relationship with brilliant people who God has assigned to intersect with your life to help you become all that you've called to be. You got a pastor. He's not perfect, but he has a heart towards the Lord. He's doing his best to try to lead you and help you. You've got a pastoral leadership team of elders and pastors who don't, who don't lead you with, with, with hubris and with pride and, and with, 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 um, with manipulation. you got people that really care for you, people that are really there for you, people who love you not because of what's in your pocket, not because of your degree, not because of, 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 of something you can give to them, but because we're just commanded to love God, love people, and do the work of the kingdom. That's what we're in. Come on, we're in a place where we worship, and we have a team that leads us in worship, and they do it well. And you can find an anointing in this place. I dare you to find a time where there wasn't the presence of God that showed up on our Sunday service or our Tuesday service. Consistently, God shows up. Some of you have received prophetic words in this house. There were times where you didn't know you were going to make it and you just walked into the sanctuary and you felt the presence of God and then somebody prayed for you. Somebody spoke into your life and they didn't realize that that day your life pivoted forever and you're still here because God used someone in your church home to speak into your life and to bless you. You were down to your last dime and you came looking for help and somebody connected you with the Vision Resource Empowerment Center and somebody sat down with you with nothing to gain from you to walk you through the difficulties of life and people took groceries and put them in your car. You needed diapers for your kids. Somebody blessed you with what you needed. Somebody helped you get some assistance with your life bill. Somebody took the time to smile at you, to hug you, to embrace 
invites you to let you know. And it's all because there was a place called New Vision. If you don't appreciate it, I'm telling you already, anniversary has already started. We can take a moment right now to thank God for this church. Thank God for this community. Let me be the first to say publicly, I don't know where I would be. Without New Vision International Ministries, I definitely wouldn't be in the cold northeast. I definitely wouldn't be in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'd probably be dying in some little Baptist church in some country town in Texas if God had not spoken and cross-grafted me, cross-pollinated the kingdom of God and a mindset for expansion and the marketplace and entrepreneurship and empowerment if God hadn't sent me here. Some of you wouldn't even be saved. You wouldn't have a reason to love God, love people, and do the work of the kingdom. But he put together a community, and he made it out of nothing. And he planted it in southern Connecticut, and it's touched the lives of many. We have a God who can create something out of nothing. And let me tell you something about this something that we're something in. This is a miracle. As you take your seat, some of us remember when they were just metal chairs. As your feet are on the carpet, some of us remember when it was just a dusty floor. As you complain because the air condition is blowing just a little bit too cold, you got to put on a jacket. Let me tell you about the days when we didn't have central air. And we sit up here sweating during the summer and freezing during the winter. Up on stage wearing winter coats. Sometimes we don't appreciate what God has done. But before New Vision was a thought in Bishop's mind, God knew us. He knew this day would come. He made us in secret, skillfully, wrought in the depths of the earth. New Vision, God saw our unformed substance. In his book, he wrote all the days ordained for us. In fact, I would even suggest that we are here because of spiritual synesthesia. That, that God used Bishop to see sound. Because before something like this comes forth, there has to be a word from the Lord. That's what we call divine initiative, that you don't start something unless God said start it. And I think this is evidence that God told Bishop to start something that was worth starting. But it started with a word from the Lord. Somebody say divine initiative. It starts with God speaking, but you need someone to be able to respond to what God is saying. Vision is the ability to see what God said. Just like a musician can hear a sound and see colors representing what was spoken, God will blend the natural and the spiritual and cause you to see what has not yet been created. That visionaries are able to blend their natural senses with the supernatural work of God and spiritual gifting to see what nobody else can see. And so God speaks, and then you begin to see what he's putting together. And leadership is the ability to position people for the promise. If God has given new vision a promise, then he gives leadership to position us for the promise. To position means to bring us together, to move us from one place to the next. Leadership is casting vision to share with people that they cannot see, but to see it for them and then through the skill of leadership to move them from one place to the next. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who gave us leadership to take us from one place to the next? We started in the merit, whatever that place is in Norwalk, in a bar, in a hotel. That's where we started. But aren't you glad we didn't stay there? I know we had some glory days in Norwalk and West Rocks and different schools and middle schools, but aren't you glad that we serve a God that didn't keep us there? And I know that we love the days of 130 Gregory Street, and we had some good times in that small building in the South End. But aren't you glad that we serve a God who takes us from glory to glory, that we're constantly progressing? And aren't you glad that he moved us even from Curiel School as we were believing God 
for this property to be completed so we can enter into it. Aren't you glad that he moved us from Curiel to 35 Benham Avenue? And aren't you glad that we are here and we're not stagnant and we're still alive and we're still growing and still preaching the gospel, still teaching about the kingdom of God, still growing in ministry, still developing youth programming, still being a leader in this community and demonstrating that God's not dead, he's surely alive. And if God is alive, his church needs to be alive. And if his church is alive, his church is living, breathing, growing. And we're constantly asking the Lord, where are you taking us next? Vision is the ability to see what God said. Leadership is the ability to position people for the promise. But here's the difficult thing about leadership. Sometimes people don't want to go where God wants to take them. That was the issue with the children of Israel. They did not want to go where God was taking them. And so there was a whole generation that died in the wilderness because they could not see what God was showing. But God will raise up another generation to take the promised land because things didn't end in the wilderness. Things continued with Joshua and the generation that is emerging. That amongst that generation, there was a Caleb and a Joshua in the wilderness who said to Moses, we see what you see and we trust where we're going. And he'll let you know that God is still doing a work in new vision. This ain't it. There's still more that God wants to do through us. This is not the final concept of ministry. And I'm not just talking about property. I'm talking about mindset. Because before we can enlarge our property, we got to enlarge our mindset. There's a shift that has to happen at every level of ministry, every level of administration, every level of staffing. We've got to get the understanding that God is not through with us yet. And we've got to begin to close our eyes and see some things spiritually. We cannot be discouraged about what we see in the natural. If you were to drive around the corner to the west side of Bridgeport, what you see in the natural is depressing, but you've got to be able to close your eyes and see that God is still at work in the broken places. God is still at work, and God can still do a work in an area, in a region like this. They call Connecticut the graveyard for preachers and churches, but we just believe that God's not done. You ain't seen nothing yet. If this is what God can do in 25 years, get excited for what he's going to do in the next 25 years. And you get to be a part of the next move of God. I'm just trying to get you excited to maybe look beyond what's going on in your personal life. To be reminded that we are a collective people and God is taking us to a collective place. And there is a promised land for God's people. He takes us from promise to promise, from precept to precept, from glory to glory, from one manifestation to the next manifestation. God's not through with us yet. Tell somebody we've come this far by faith. <laughs> you might even want to get a little Baptist in order to say, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed us yet. Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord, that before we move to something, we hear something. Before we see something, we hear something. Our faith's not for stuff. Our faith is in a person who speaks. Our faith is in the Lord God Almighty. Our faith is that he never fails. Our faith is in him that if he speaks and if he says it, he can bring it to pass. Come here, Abraham. Abraham is the father of the faith. God appeared to him in the book of Genesis and said, I'm going to do something for you, but I need you to leave what's comfortable and go to a place that you've never been before. And the scripture says that it was credited to righteousness to Abraham because he was willing to walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Every once in a while, you got to stop looking and start looking. Every once in a while, you got to turn off your TV, turn off your Instagram, turn off your Facebook, and just sit in the presence of God and say, God, I've seen all these things in the natural, but now I want to see something in the spiritual. I'm here to let you know that sometimes you can't trust your eyes because looks can be deceiving, and I know how it is. You've got stuff going on in your life. You've got all types of drama and trauma that you're dealing with in the four walls of your home, and then you come into the four walls of the church, hoping for a breakthrough, hoping for a touch from the Lord. And I'm here to let you know that God is still able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can think 
and or imagine that he will put you in a place where people of faith to remind you that God hasn't forgotten about you, to remind you that God is still with you, to remind you that God is still worthy to be praised despite the craziness that you survived this week. The only way that you're going to survive, and remember what Bishop taught us, that worshipers will survive. You survive that every time you clap your hands, every time you lift your voice, every time you magnify the Lord, every time you lift up his name, he just giving you a greater insight into the spirit realm so you can see what he's doing. I'm here to remind you that God still is at work. I'm here to remind you that God still can make something out of nothing. I'm here to remind you that God still can do anything because he's great and he's mighty. All I need is a memory of a victory. Can I run down some victories? New vision is a victory. A uh, memory of a victory. <laughs> there are people that prophesied this church wouldn't last uh, for three years, but here we are, 25 years old, surviving recessions, surviving presidential elections, surviving COVID, surviving pandemics, and we're here stronger than we've ever been before. They said we wouldn't make it, but look at us now. God has been faithful. Some of you have experienced miracles in your own life personally. You came to us telling us that there was a diagnosis and you didn't know how long you were going to live, but you called for the elders of the church. You called for the pastors and the intercessors and they prayed for you and things got better. You're an example of a miracle. Some of us shouldn't even be alive because of stuff that we did, ways that we messed up. We should have died in the prison cell, but people from New Vision wrote to you while you were in prison and now here you are in ministry because God put a support network that will be a lifeline for you. Some of y'all were in the streets with nobody want to sit next to you but here you are serving in ministry and God picked you up, turned you around, placed your feet on solid ground, gave you a concept of the kingdom of God and now you're not a part of a gang. You don't belong to the streets. You belong to the kingdom of God and you're walking in authority, understanding your anointing because God decided to put you in a place that would preach the kingdom of God and preach the cross and preach to the lost and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. God could have put you in the church with a bunch of charlatans. People that are just playing and faking the funk trying to get into your pockets and lying to you, prophesying to you to get you to come back every week. No, but this is a place where the gospel is preached. The gospel is taught to the kids. The gospel is taught to the young adults. The gospel is preached to the young and the old. A place that more interested in getting you into heaven than just getting you to become a member of the church. He's placed you in a fruitful place that God himself has ordained. High five somebody and tell them, thank God for this place. Not only thank God for this place, this physical place, but you ought to thank God for the season that you're in. Huh? Some of you are being pressed like you've never been pressed before. Remember, there could be no olive oil without the pressing of the olives. Huh? There could be no wine without the crushing of the grapes. Huh? This crushing season is working something out in your life. There can be no potter's clay. There could be no jar without the spinning and the pressing and the heat. Thank God for this place. And even though it looks bad, tell somebody it's better than it looks. See, looks can be deceiving. A person, place, or thing can be very different from the way it seems or appears at first glance. Which brings us to our passage for today. There's a man that was just helping the man of God. Let me talk to those of you who are serving and have no name. See, when I was studying the scriptures earlier, there was another servant that had a name and he started tripping. And then God raises up another servant for Elisha who has no name but is with the man of God in battle. This young man wakes up one day and goes out and sees that the enemies and the adversaries of Israel have rallied around the man of God. Sit if you can for just a second. We'll be done in just a few minutes. Second Kings chapter 6 verse 15 says, Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And the servant said to him, Alas, master, what shall we do? Now, this is a real situation. This is not metaphorical. You know, this was not metaphorical. Horses and chariots that surrounded. No, these were, these were people with weapons. Armies that were approaching their location. 
The servant of the man of God was simply reporting what his natural eyes could see. The horses were real. The chariots were real. The threat was real. And I get it because some of you are going through adversities that are real. The bills that you got on your counter are real. And your faith doesn't make them disappear. Because <laughs> remember, your faith is in someone. Your faith is in God. And sometimes God gives us the ability to endure instead of escape. And you come and worship and, 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 and you worship God and, and you shouting and you praising. And when you go home, them bills still going to be on the counter. They're not going to miraculously disappear and dissipate and dissolve. And, and, and no, they're going to keep on sending them. <laughs> and God may work something out, but, 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 but sometimes we have to deal with the reality of our situation. What I'm trying to say is that faith does not exempt us from reality. Being people of faith does not exempt us from tough things. The lab results that you got last week about your medical condition, they're real and they are serious. Your limitations of your natural resources. You didn't have no money when you walked in here. And just because you sweating and shouting and lifting your hands <laughs> doesn't mean you will go home and check your bank statements and all of a sudden have a miraculous. Now, now, God can do it. But, but, but maybe, just maybe, we got to look at things from a different perspective. That sometimes God allows us to go through real adversity so that we can rely upon him in the midst of the adversity. So the problems you deal with are real. The natural stuff that you have going on is real stuff. You're trying to figure out how to parent your kids. That's real. You're trying to figure out what your next move is in your career. That's real. But I need to remind you that God can put the super on the natural. And that's what some of us need today. We need God to put the super on the natural. And what the scriptures teach us as we look at what God did for others, we're reminded that our limitations are not God's limitations. That our worries are not God's worries. And our weaknesses are not God's weaknesses. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In fact, according to the scripture, the apostle Paul taught us this, that when we are weak, he is made strong. So maybe we just need God to put the super on the natural. Tell somebody, put the super on the natural. If they just look like they need encouragement. <laughs> Don't judge them now. We just tell them, put the super on the natural. <laughs> See, y'all didn't even want to look. Okay, tell yourself. Lord put, the super Lord, put the super on the natural. On the natural. And that illustration is just proving my point because sometimes you need someone a little bit higher than you to remind you to put the super on the natural. And that's exactly what we see in this passage. So the servant goes out and sees the real adversity and goes to his mentor, his spiritual father, his covering, and says, yo, they're out there. Horses, chariots, weapons, and it took his mentor to help him see the supernatural. It took someone covering him to remind him or to introduce him to spiritual reality. Sometimes God will put a pastor in your life, a bishop in your life, a spiritual parent in your life, someone who's just a little bit further than you are spiritually to remind you of the spiritual realities that surround you. So the attendant's mentor, Elisha, was well aware and acquainted with the supernatural realm. When you study the life of Elisha and you study this scripture, you'll see that up until this point, Elisha had already participated in about 12 miracles. That means that there were at least 12 documented times where Elisha was involved in the supernatural work of a holy God. 12 times where Elisha was privy to the miracles of heaven where he was actively involved in God coming from heaven and infusing himself in the earth to do something that could not be explained. Elisha was seasoned in the supernatural. He was gifted, if you will, with spiritual Synesthesia. 
Remember, synesthesia in the natural is the blending of senses. But don't you ever forget that you have natural senses and then we have spiritual senses. And those who are gifted in the Lord have the blending of the natural and the spiritual together. That is not just some biological chemical makeup of the brain and the nervous system creating and giving a visualization. No, there is something beyond nature. Not paranormal, because there's stuff that happens in the woods of Connecticut that's paranormal. I'm talking about supernatural. Supernatural suggests that it comes from a divine, holy God for a strategic reason. And God will place his hand on a person in the earth and gift them with the blending of natural and supernatural abilities just to demonstrate his glory. God will empower his people with spiritual gifts and abilities that glorify him. And I said something on Wednesday night to our students in ministry as I pray for our pastoral leadership team I said Lord stir up the gifts that are already inside of them and I'm here to let you know new vision there's some stuff that's inside of you that's about to get stirred up I told you that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and there's certain gifts that God gives without repentance he gives people creative ability whether or not they want to glorify him or not there are some amazing musicians that are going to bust hell wide open that can see colors and, and they can sing music and they can do what are impressive things yet they do not have a relationship with the creator but God is so God he'll give them the gift and he knitted them with that ability before they were in their mother's womb oh, but for the believer we have more we have the deposit of the Holy Spirit and sight of us and God can supercharge our natural gifts. He can endow us with supernatural things because of our submission to him. He can use anybody and anything for his glory and he'll remind you that God wants to use you. Oh man, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. You were created for more than just sitting in the red chairs and hearing somebody preach out you. God wants to use you. God wants to use you and your family. God wants to use you and your community. God wants to use you and your industry. God wants to use you in the marketplace. God wants to use you with your gifts and your talents and your abilities. God formed and fashioned you. First natural, then spiritual. You are born again. And when you're born again, it unlocks a whole new world of how God wants to use you. God wants to use you. And so we see in the scripture, God can take a person and blend their natural and their spiritual. Let me give you an example. Most recently in the text, God showed Elisha something supernatural. Here's what was happening. There was a group of people who were against Israel, the people of Aram. There was a king that wanted to do damage to the people of God. And God would use Elisha to show Israel where the king of Aram was moving next. And it got so bad, it got to a point where the king of Aram pulled together his troops and said, who is it in our ranks that's a, that's a rat? Somebody is hearing our plans and then going to Israel and telling them because every time we go to the next place, Israel has already moved. And someone spoke up and said, there's a man in Israel. He hears the very words that are in your bedroom. God was supernaturally showing Elisha where the enemy would be next. And Elisha was always two steps ahead of his enemies and his adversaries. That is a work of God. Do you realize that God can show you stuff that nobody else knows? Can you realize that God can give you insight and wisdom that can keep you ahead of the thing that's trying to take you out. And while you're worried about your bills and you're worried about your problems, don't you forget that there is a God who can walk you through your bills and walk you through your problems. He can give you an anointing to pick up that phone and negotiate with your creditors. He can show you the things necessary to progress your career. And the reason why you're stalled is because he's just trying to get you to pause long enough to seek his face and not his hand. And that what you need for the next step in your career is only found at the altar he wants to speak to you he wants to breathe on you he wants to anoint you afresh and if you could just wait long enough to hear what he says he won't just bless your spiritual gifts he'll bless your natural gifts I'm here to remind you that we serve a God who can do anything he can give you a word ahead of what's going to happen you may not know your enemy's next move but God does you may not know what your enemy's next move is. You may not know what's going to happen next, but trust and rest assured that God knows. God's not only tracking you, he's tracking everything around you, and he's working it for the good of those who love him. If you love him, it's working for your good. 
Because God's about to perform another miracle through Elisha, but in order to perform this miracle, the enemy had to get close enough for him to be able to pronounce what he was going to pronounce, that sometimes God is positioning us. The enemy is so slow. He's playing checkers, and God is already playing chess. He's already an entire lifetime ahead of the enemy. And just when the enemy thinks that he's gotten some ground, God shows up and once again gets the glory. I don't know how I can tell you this. I've told you once. I've told you before. The devil is defeated. He's a loser. He will not win. God has already checkmated him. There's already a place for him. There's already a lake of fire that's prepared for him. You flip all the way to the back of the book, we win. But until we get to that point, we've got to trust in the Lord with all our might. Lean not into our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Tell somebody, God's tracking you. You feel overwhelmed right now? God knows. You've exhausted your resources? God knows. If the challenges of life have surrounded you on every side, God knows and he cares. I know you're starting to panic just like the servant. I know you're wondering whether or not you're going to get through it just like the servant. I know you're beginning to visualize your demise. Have you ever just visualized your death and you just say, oh, but I guess I'm going to go this way. You start to have these demonic ideas of how you were going to be done and God will interrupt your pity party to remind you that it's not over until he says it's over. Why are you planning your funeral and God says it's not over until he says it's over? Why are you planning getting fired and, and, and you still are on the roll of your employer because it's not over till God says it's over. Why are you visualizing yourself getting kicked out of your house, getting kicked out of your neighborhood and still yet God is still at work. God is still moving on your behalf. The servant began to panic but the seasoned man of God began to pray. I'm here to let you know instead of panicking, God wants to teach us how to pray. He wants to teach us how to appeal to heaven. He wants to teach us how to go to him. So the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elijah answered, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are against us. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by a holy God. The numbers of God are always greater than the numbers of the enemy. I don't know what you have to face when you leave these four walls, but I'm here to let you know that if you love Jesus, if you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, then God is with you, and if God is for you, who can be against you? I'm here to remind you that if God is for you, who can be against you? I'm here to remind you that if God is for us, who can be against you? I'm here to remind you that if God is for us, who can be against you? I'm here to remind you that if God is for us, who can be against us? I'm here to remind you that if God is for us, who can be against us? If our God is for us, then who can never stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus. There's no height, there's no depth, there's no bill, there's no enemy, there's no adversary, there's no challenge. There's no army that can stand against God and his people. So I'm going to pray the same prayer that Elisha prayed for the servant. God opened his eyes so that he can see the horses and the chariots of fire that are surrounding our situation. I'm praying right now for a new vision for everybody that's wrestling, everyone that's struggling. I'm saying, Lord, open their eyes so they can see something spiritual. Open their eyes so they can see the color of the fire of the horses and the chariots and the angels and the resources that are just waiting for the word of the Lord. All God has to do is speak and everything changes. All the Lord has to say is go and the angels that have charge will now move into position to do what God said. All I need is a memory of a victory if god did it before he can do it again if god did it for elisha he can do it for new vision if god did it for the saints of old uh, certainly he can do it for the modern day saints uh, you ought to get excited because god's still on the throne god's still moving by his power in fact things have to get bad things have to get worse uh, that way only god gets the glory 
I don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, but I know God's on the throne. I know that somehow he's going to work it together for the good of those who love God. You ought to make sure that you love God. You ought to make sure that you're in position. You ought to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do while God does what only he can do. High five somebody and tell them, get in position. Get in position. Get in position. Get in position. Open your eyes and see that God's in position. And because God's in position, I'm gonna get in position. I'm gonna stand still and see the salvation of my God. He's still working miracles. I just want you to open your eyes and see that God hasn't left his people. God hasn't left new vision. There still are some giants that gotta fall. But before the giant falls, we've got to fall down to our knees. We've got to pray like we've never prayed before. We've got to ask the Lord to open up our spiritual eyes. What we need is in the heavens, not in a bank account. What we need is a move from God. What we need is a word from God. What we need is a miracle from God. What we need is an anointing from God. What we need is from heaven. Open up your mouth and say, God send down your fire God if you do it don't do it without me God I need a fresh anointing for the next battle open my eyes so I can see what you're doing if you're tired I ask God to open up your minds if you're cranky I ask God to open up your eyes if you're depressed I ask God to open up your eyes if you're struggling, I ask God to open up your eyes and see the spiritual economy that's surrounding you. God is still working and still moving by his power. He's still moving by his power. If you believe he's moving by his power, can you just do one, one more favor? One last time, open up your mouth. I know you're tired, but the spirit is just getting started. Come on, you need energy to get through this week energy to get through this next year it's time to receive what god has from heaven for the next level for the next dimension he wants to touch his people he wants to revive his people he wants to quicken his people he wants to jump start his people he's just jump starting us because he's getting ready to run us to this next place to run us to this next dimension he's looking for people who are ready for the next level if you're ready you might be tired but say lord i'm ready for whatever's next. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. It's tired and broken, it's broken down as I am. I wanna be qualified for this next move. He's looking for vessels that are not perfect because he puts his treasure in broken vessels so that the excellence of the treasure can be of him and not of the vessel itself. God can use some broken people who acknowledge where their help comes from. God can use some broke people who acknowledge where their provision comes from. God can use some weak people who acknowledge where their power comes from. My power comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. My provision comes from the Lord. Some of you have been stuck and God is about to unstuck you. He's about to unstick you. You're about to shift and you're about to see things from a different dimension. Don't be afraid. He's still fighting battles for you. Don't be alarmed. He's still with you. God's going to open your eyes to see that he's working things out. On behalf of those who love him. The enemy is using fear, doubt, and discouragement to try to choke out the people of God. We're so saturated by the media and our favorite political pundits. We're so carnal, scrolling with these content creators and people whose livelihood is based on capturing our attention. We're getting so overwhelmed by an economy that we have no control over that perhaps we've forgotten where our help and where our strength comes from. I'm preaching hard because we got to wake up. This next dimension 
requires the activation of our senses, both natural and spiritual. I know I joke around sometimes about how we come to service and we sleep. But just think with me for just a second. The strategy of the enemy is to numb our spiritual senses. A lot of times he'll use our natural senses as an excuse as to why our spiritual senses aren't kicking. So part of what God does is he will shake us up in the natural to get our attention spiritually. Come on, church. God is getting our attention spiritually. I've been praying this prayer all week. Lord, help us to hear what you're saying and help us to see what you are showing. I'm here to speak to some of you that you shall live and not die. I'm here to speak to some of you that God is allowing the circumstances that you're in. If you haven't escaped it yet, there's a reason why he has you enduring it because there's certain things he's building within you. That sometimes when we fail, we're actually failing forward. The failure was to position us so that he can work through us, this time with humility rather than hubris. To get us to the point where we realize that it's not our power or our strength, but it's his power and his strength. The enemy wants to numb you with the situations of life. God wants you to get to the point where you realize that you need him more than your natural senses. Some of you are going through some stuff. You can't sense your way through it in the natural. You can't call it. As gifted as you are, and some of you have been endowed with tremendous natural talents on your job, in your career, but all of a sudden it seems like it's not working anymore. Sometimes we put too much confidence in our flesh, too much confidence in our ability to do something or to make something happen. And God will call us back to the carpet to hear from him. And then we'll realize that if it's going to happen, it's going to be because he's going to give directives and he's going to speak. God is still speaking, church. So as we step into this anniversary season, I just want you to stretch and to think differently about church and ministry that, as I mentioned, many of us have been blessed personally by this church. God will put a collective people together. And yes, we're blessed personally. But there are things that he calls us to do. There's a reason why he brings us together. And a culture that's so highly individualized and everybody's doing what meets their needs and this consumer Christianity where people just come and get stuff from places because of what they need. God is saying, I have need of my people because I created you for a purpose. I have need of that purpose. According to Ephesians chapter 2, we are his workmanship created in advance for good works that God wants to take your natural and put the super on it. And for some of you, he wants to use you in a mighty way. But it begins with an awareness of who he is and what he's doing. And so I'm going to pray now. There is a, it's almost like a shell that's on God's people. <clears throat> when your heart is hardened, if you can get the picture, it's like there's a crust that forms around it. Almost like a concrete where we can't feel what God is doing. You know, we find ourselves in a season like this. And New Vision is not perfect, but I know we preach the word. I know Christ is at the center. I know we try our best to serve with humility. I know the word's coming forth. I know worship is, is, is happening at a high level. I know we're raising up the kids and pouring into them. But in this region in particular, in the Northeast, there's a contest in the heavens for this region. And the work of the remnant is so important to this region. But in order for the region to be one, the remnant has to be activated. And if the remnant is wrestling with its understanding of who God is, if the remnant is wrestling, if the church is not on the right page with God, if we are still so caught up and so overwhelmed by our situations that we can't do what God has called us and commissioned us to do, we don't get the benefit of participating in God's work. God is at work. And so just humor me for a second. Sometimes in the world, we are trending with what the world is trending with. You know, all these folks that have been exposed, these celebrities, this, this contentious presidential election, 
all this stuff captures our attention and sometimes draws us away from the primary attention that we should be giving to a holy God. And we begin to internalize the fears of the culture and society. We begin to get fleshy. God is breaking our carnal Christianity. Some of us are so carnal. And we know what God has done for us. And it's not that we're not saved. It's just that we have to be willing to let go and truly embrace what God is showing to be willing to go from the natural to the spiritual. But let me tell you something about being spiritual gifted. gifted. There is a responsibility that sits upon you when you say yes to God's commandments and what he's calling you to do because your life is not your own. And I think what happens, especially in this region, everybody's just trying to survive. Everybody's just trying to live their life. Everybody's just trying to do their thing with the false promise that those things will validate our identity and who we are. And we haven't gotten the revelation that the only thing that validates us is doing God's will, that our identity is in him, not in the stuff that we pursue, not in the life that we're trying to make for ourselves. And so God will place a church like New Vision in a region like this to, to shake up the fallow ground and to break through the concrete that's around the hearts of people. So here's my plea to you, New Vision, that your heart not be hardened by what's happening in society. On Wednesday, there are going to be many people mourning and many people celebrating this presidential election. I try my best to preach and teach the word of God. Whatever happens on Tuesday should not phase the church and the body of Christ. In fact, God has been preparing us for whatever happens next. And he's still carving and pulling his people towards him.